Some gods have always existed. Some are born, others die. Some care for you, even love you, though many don't. This one doesn't. It was born in 1551, as far as we know. Now, it watches from heaven, guiding our paths through the day. We know its embrace when we wake and when we go to sleep. Like all gods, it was made by men. And like all gods, our worship and burnt offerings sustain it. Its ways are mysterious, having some time ago become inscrutable even to its followers, who are now claimed by it. From billions of mouths it declares, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Nothing in all creation is hidden from its sight. Everything is exposed and uncovered before its eyes. I speak its words here also. The theology of the machine god, a machine of machines. A god is at its most terrifying when it doesn't know that it is what it is. Azathoth, the blind idiot god, or Samael, the blind demiurge. Like them, the machine has its prophets, its devoted servants, its scriptures. Today, it has turned the skin of the world inside out. In 2019, foreign policy is domestic policy, in my view, and domestic policy is foreign policy. They're deeply connected, a deeply connected set of choices we make about how to advance the American way of life and our vision for the future. No longer any distinction between the outside and the inside. Well, look, we've reached a point where foreign policy is domestic policy and domestic policy is foreign policy. The earth is peeled like an orange so as to lay flat, a friction-free topography of exchange. In the 17th century, Pascal described the natural world as an infinite sphere, the center of which is everywhere, the circumference nowhere. In short, it is the greatest sensible mark of the almighty power of God that imagination loses itself in that thought. Which God is that, Pascal, who can infinitesimalize the form of space itself? You were of its time, weren't you? Its origin? The origin of a destructive, fluid, machinic deity, both everywhere and nowhere. One thing we all know about machines is that they never appear spontaneously. They are assembled then evolve over time by harnessing energy in the environment and converting it into useful energy. This world machine was assembled in 1551 in good old England as a little company, the Company of Merchant Adventurers. The company commissioned four ships, including the Edward Bond Adventure, captained by Richard Chancellor and a crew of experienced sailors whose bodies would be the first of many sacrifices required to power the machine. All four ships wrecked on the way home and all their crew members and captains died. But by some nefarious design, there was one lone survivor of the expedition, not even a sailor, but an envoy in the employ of Tsar Ivan the Terrible, whose name was Osip Nepea. Because Nepea was spared, he was able to foment the business relationship between his master and the ship's masters. Sparing Nepea is perhaps the first known intervention of the machine god in human affairs, a forgotten event of history that would change its course forever. The destiny of Earth is now this destiny. So here, 
let's get into the story. The Edward Bonaventure had been commissioned by a group of some 240 private investors, which included many of England's political and economic elite. For example, the Lord High Treasurer and the Lord High Admiral. This group styled themselves, and and keep in mind this was the days before brand recognition was a thing, but they called themselves the Marchands Adventurers of England for the discovery of lands, territories, isles, dominions, and seigneuries unknown, and not before that late adventure or enterprise by sea or navigation commonly frequented. And the main purpose of this company was to seek out virgin markets particularly to offload the surplus of cloth they had built up. This elite cabal called themselves adventurers, although notably, they themselves did not do any of the adventuring. Rather, it was their excess wealth going on adventure. Shares in the company were sold for 25 pounds each, with the promise of big returns. 25 pounds in the mid-16th century was many times the yearly wage of a normal person, including the ship's crew. So this was an incredibly exclusive entry fee. All of the actual adventurers either froze to death or drowned. The 240 sent the Edward Bond adventure to seek out the fabled Northeast Passage, hoping they would find a route to the riches of Asia. Ultimately, they had to settle for Russia, where they negotiated trade rights with Ivan the Terrible, and the company did see a massive return on their initial investment, as this group later incorporated as the Muscovy Company, the world's first major joint stock company, a shareholder corporation. English ships left with textiles, salts, precious metals, and weapons, and returned from Russia with rope, lumber, furs, and saltpeter. The company was granted property, given freedom from arrest, and set up warehouses in Muscovy, and would remain there until the Russian Revolution, almost four centuries later. This first joint stock enterprise, the Muscovy Company, made the 240 very wealthy, while gambling with others' lives. This produced a new program for the future, a way for surplus capital to produce more capital. Within the next decades, the same program would be followed by the Levant Company, the Venice Company, the East India Company, the Virginia Company, and the Hudson's Bay Company. Not to mention all the Dutch, French, and Spanish companies that would copy this original model. These companies became incredibly powerful. They hired their own private armies and navies. And I'm sure you know what happened to many of the people living in these so-called virgin markets. This is the spawn point of the global program that's still today trying to invent new virgin markets, having run out of space on Earth. Establishing property rights in space so that their incentives to go and explore and develop. And by the way, I've made a prediction. I believe the first trillionaire will be made in space. The metaverse is the next frontier. Fortune favors the brave. From a single fruit body of private investment by the blessed and the powerful, these spores spread out across the earth, and the significance of this event cannot be understated. For the first time, the world was rendered as a single fluid surface, as Pascal believed it was, in which lazy capital is energized to reproduce, capital used to create capital, capital used to create one world, mondialization. Like all machines, these ones need energy. Like all gods, this one demands sacrifice before rewards. The great energy required to generate this global surface was the sacrifice of blood. That initial surplus had to come from somewhere, namely 
shipfuls of dead sailors and unclassed bodies chained figuratively or literally to whichever looms produced that extra cloth in 1551. Bodies and lives are the fuel of the machine of machines, lord of lords, powering each new adventure and the creation of the world. <laughs>